Thanks a lot, Reed. So Ruth, are you still here? No, I'd love to meet your son, though. So the world belongs to me now. What an ambitious statement, a good dose of aspiration, and quite a bit of audacity in it as well. And I think, you know, at the highest level, we really are talking about, about Ruth's son, and the world belongs to me now. And I think the question that we're facing is, what world are we going to give to Ruth's son or to Sarah? Uh, to Sarah? Um, and I think the, uh, the real answer is it depends, to be honest. And I think if we're looking at countries that are experiencing a youth bulge, it really depends. It depends on how we manage some of the transitions that we've been speaking about. Um, and if we manage them well, we can see, hopefully, a demographic dividend. We can see increased economic opportunities and growth following these uh, sort of bul youth bulge in, in many countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Middle East as well. But if we don't manage the transitions well, there could be disaster, frustration, social upheaval. Um, unemployment is already highest among uh, uh, the youth today, but that even increasing. So that's what we're trying to do, I think, with the Youth Safe Consortium and with the discussion we're having today around youth financial services. Now, I'd love to focus a bit more on, on sort of the client side of it, but I can't. The other panelists did it all day. I'm actually going to focus a bit more on the financial service provider perspective and the policy making perspective for thinking about offering financial services to youth. But before I do that, I can't help myself since we took a client-centered approach to this session today. I want to hear a little bit from all of you in this room and about your experiences with financial services. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hands as I ask different questions and apologies to folks on the webinar that I can't see. So who in this room at birth basically got a, a, a savings account? Okay, so a, a small number of people. Who, by the time they were teenagers, had a savings account? Okay, a lot more. And um, who, when you were a teenager, you had a savings account, were you able to do your own transactions? Okay, great. So I think, again, I don't know the nationalities of everybody here in this room. I assume we have many Americans and probably a smattering of other nationalities. And I don't know where you grew up, but I think it's very uh, telling to see what's happening in this room. So very few people at birth, but if you get to look at countries like the Netherlands, it would be completely different. It would be almost everybody in the room would have said yes. And quite a high number um, as teenagers, including um, people who actually had control over the accounts, which I think is very exciting. And the answers would not be the same in most emerging markets that we would go to. So now I really want to focus a bit on, you know, given that in many parts of the world the answers would have been different, what is the potential policy case for youth savings? And I mean, the youth are obviously a really important demographic group for reasons that have been mentioned before. And I'd like to, to posit that there are at least three um, really great opportunities on the policy making side. The first one has been mentioned a lot um, already by Jamie and, and others, which is the asset building theory. Uh, Michael Sheridan, who's part of the Youth Surf Save Consortium, his colleague Lee is in the back, did a lot of work around asset uh, building theory and the asset effect that is both a material effect, so if you build assets, that is a good thing in terms of better access to education, to health care, to improved living, uh, living standards, uh, housing standards, pardon me, but also behavioral um, effects, which, um, which Alex and others touched upon, uh, the better cognitive skills, the future orientation. So policy making case for asset building, very important. The second uh, one that I would describe is around good financial habits. So very early on, building good financial habits. And we, I think all of us, even the ones that are no longer such kids in the room, know that what we start to do early in life, we tend to have her, er, hap, a rapid uptake. We tend to remember it, the practice that also Alex mentioned um, um, being very um, important. The third uh, aspect from a policymaking perspective that I think makes youth savings important is the fact that many countries actually have an explicit objective to increase their growth savings rate. And the U.S. is one country where that's uh, not, do it's not doing so well on this front. Um, but it's important both from a household perspective, so the household having more savings to be able to deal with vulnerabilities, to be able to manage shocks that life will bring, but also at the macro-national level, having capital for investment is very important. 
But there are challenges, and these have come up actually through the questions and answers um, uh, period. So first of all, the issue of legal age to enter into a contract. So in most countries, you become a major at 16 or 18 or even 21 in some countries, and you need to be of that legal age to open a formal relationship with a formal financial institution. Um, and I think here, what's I think exciting is we're seeing some differentiation now between um, the opening of the contract the um, ownership of the contract of the of the contract of the bank account and the transacting um, and we're seeing different uh, regulators around the world trying to build in flexibility to allow minors to enter into contracts so even if for example they have to have an adult with them to open the account they might be able to transact on their own especially when it comes to depositing even though for withdrawals they might need to have the adult with them, but maybe the adult will not be able to withdraw alone if the minor is not there. So I think there is exciting things happening um, on that front. And there was a question asked about consumer protection. I think we have to remember, however strongly we want to advocate for youth savings, that there are real com consumer protection reasons for having legal age of contracts. And I think we shouldn't forget that. The second sort of question mark out there, and this came up also around the policymaking side, is the documentation needed to open savings account. I mean, the good news is that around the world, when we speak about financial inclusion, there are exciting things happening in terms of relaxing documentation requirements w as appropriate. So for example, the Financial Action Task Force, a standard setting body that deals with uh, Know Your Customer regulations, for example, is actually has explicitly said we need to have tiered know your customer regulations. So if you're talking about very small account balances, we should be able to allow less stringent, um, have less stringent regulations. And so school IDs was mentioned as one example of relaxing the documentation requirements. So these were sort of three positive things on the policy making side, two question mark concerns outstanding. I'm going to very quickly now move to the financial service providers. Um, Anne had asked you know, more questions about the financial service provider perspective. And here I think there's a lot of opportunities um, out there for financial service providers to be interested in offering savings accounts to the young. I think the most powerful one is this idea of building loyal lifetime, uh, a loyal lifetime customer base. If you acquire a person early in their lives into your financial institution, if you serve them well and meet their evolving needs over time, likelihood is that you'll keep them. And there was a study done in six European countries, including France and Germany, that actually showed that 85% of people never changed their bank in their lifetime. So good develop, developed country experience there. And I think, Lisa, you mentioned cross-selling when you were talking and the importance of that. So the idea is that if you acquire a client young with savings, over the, over the years, you can cross-sell different products to them and make them very attractive, even if they're not attractive on a product base. As a client, a total client value, they could be quite attractive. The second um, sort of, I think, uh, uh, very op positive point from a financial service pers uh, provider perspective is the idea that youth um, have networks that are very important. So if you get the youth in, they're often early adopters of new things, including technology, including perhaps formal financial services. So if you get them in early, you might be able to get their parents into your bank down the road, their friends into the bank down the road, which would also reduce your cost of acquiring new clients. A third positive point with regard to financial service providers, and those of you who come from the microfinance side um, will, uh, will know that we have seen some saturation in some markets like Bosnia, um, like Nicaragua, like India, around very specific client segments um, uh, and around very specific uh, products. So increasingly, we're seeing some providers saying, I won't want to and I need to expand my market share, and I can't do it by still targeting that one type of clientele. I need to develop new client segments. Um, and so in those countries that are facing competitive pr pressures, the youth client segment could be a quite exciting market to go after. And finally, and frankly, not to be, I think, neglected, is this concept of brand and building um, an image for strong corporate social, social responsibility. That can be a way for commercial institutions to, down the line, um, look at a client segment seriously. It starts it as, as social responsibility, but could evolve. But, and I only have two points on sort of the real thorny issues that uh, financial service providers uh, face, but they're really important ones, and both of my points have the word profitability in them with a question mark. 
So the short-term profitability for the financial service provider to offer a savings account to youth is uncertain. I think we just have to be very clear about that. And it's one of the reasons I actually wanted to start with the public policy case, because I think it's also important to remember the case may be a public policy case. Um, and the reasons are obvious. Small balance accounts in of themselves, forget just youth, um, you know, are costly and, and often uh, not profitable on a product, standalone product basis. Although again, from a client, total client value perspective may be profitable. Um, and so there are real um, challenges there. At least again, showed the, infra the data from at least the four pilots that were not really so far, it's early, early, early days, but so far mostly looking at in-school youth. So if then if you're talking about getting to out-of-school youth, which I think we would want to, low-income youth, that's gonna drive the cost up most likely. So that's a real challenge. And unfortunately, my second point, the long-term profitability is unclear as well. Um, and so, you know, we know that most, many, many boards across all kinds of institutions are conservative and they want to know up front, you know, when am I going to break even on this and when am I going to start making profits on this? However, we also know that boards with vision, I think, think about things somewhat differently and in a lot of the conversations that we've had with the 15 or so financial service providers that are, are mentioned in a, in a paper that's outside when we get to your drinks, um, you'll see that often they have a strategic vision to go out, to go for the youth market and to go to, for, to, to this market with savings products. They have a strategic long-term vision. They frankly don't necessarily do the math right away. They eventually will always do the math. So eventually we've got to crack this profitability nut. Technology could be a real piece of it in terms of sort of reducing transaction costs and reducing the costs of acquiring clients uh, um, and, and staying in touch with them. Um, but I do think some of the discussion needs to be reframed from the immediate business case to really understand strategically why would a smart commercial financial institution care about this, um, this client segment. Now, the cocktail will be yours soon, my friends, but I do want to leave you with a couple of areas. I'm a bit like Alex, I like next steps, that I think requires um, more thought, more energy, more study. And I think this is really important because I am seeing in certain circles, to be very frank with you, this almost advocacy uh, fervor for youth savings. And although I have an inner advocate for youth savings, I also i am careful because I know from the microfinance world what backlash can mean if you overstate things without the evidence base. Um, so th food for thought in terms of areas that require more, more investigation and reflection. The first piece, um, um, is really better understanding and getting more data on the social impact of having youth access saving services. Intuitively, it makes so much sense to me. I spent a lot of my time in Europe growing up and it, it just makes so much sense, but we need the data and we need the data from developing countries, not just developed countries. Um, I think we also need to better understand at the national level how different parts of government can work together to really try and create smart incentives to get youth to save. So it's not just the Ministry of Finance, it could be the Ministry of Youth, the Ministry of Sports. There are really many different parts of government, often at the national level, interested in youth. And so how do they come together to create the right set of incentives, I think is really important. Thirdly, I think we need more innovation, more experimentation on the provider side. I think we need to understand what is different about serving youth. Is it the product design? Is it the marketing channel? Is it the marketing itself? Is it financial capability? Probably a little bit of all of the above, but we need to better understand these different pieces and what's important, what needs to be different, and how they interplay with each other. We, gotta, we do eventually have to get the numbers in terms of the profit and business case. We have to be, be able to figure, that, figure this out down the line. And my final, final word um, will be um, to really, again, if we think about the world and where we're trying to go, complex lives that these youth face, um, often intertwining, as Tanaya said, all three transitions at once. And so I think we need to really think of the set of interventions that respond to their needs holistically. And I think holistically, both in terms of the financial services, we're talking about savings here, which is a critical saving uh, sa a product, but probably they need a range of different financial services, and they also need non-financial services. So understanding that full set of interventions that youth will need, while each of us in the different roles that we place, also I think seeing focus in terms of the areas of expertise that we bring to the table to then meet client needs is what I think is ahead of, ahead of us.
So with those few words, I have the honor of, on behalf of New America Foundation, to invite you to drinks and continued conversation right outside. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.